All right, let's get started for today. A um, couple of announcements all about midterm two, which is coming up next week, Monday evening. There are four rooms this time. They're not exactly the same set of rooms as last time. So check which room you are in. It's also on the midterm prep page. Four different rooms based on last name. The topics are from lecture 12, which is probability, all the way through the perception lecture, which was last week, Thursday. Um, inclusive last week, Thursday's lecture. But those are the only topics. We're not gonna ask you about the first 11 lectures, just 12 through 21. Um, of course, also corresponding homework sections and so forth. There's a midterm two prep page, which has past exams. Um, check those out. There are special midterm two office hours. Check out the schedule. There's a little Google calendar thingy that you can just you know, do to use to import office hours into your own calendar. Um, there's also a practice midterm. The idea here is that ideally you'd study for the midterm, you think you're prepared, you take the practice midterm. If you ace it, you know you're prepared, you're all good to go. If you don't ace it, still have some time left to prep some extra before the actual midterm. So the practice midterm is due on Saturday, uh, right before midnight. Any questions about logistics? All right, let's get started with kernels and clustering then. So we're going to look at a different way of doing classification today. Um, it's called case-based learning. Um, here's some motivation. Let's say you have non-separable data as shown here. You might say, well, this green separating line is what I want, but you might also say, well, I know that these labels are not noisy. I know that the plus here really is a plus, and I want to be able to carve out a part of that region to label it as plus if I get new examples there. If you just use a linear classifier like the perceptron would give you, you wouldn't be able to do this. The best you can do is find the best linear classifier. It'll be something like what's shown here, and that's where it stops, okay? At least as far as you've covered it in last lecture. So today we'll start looking at how to go beyond that and have more flexible decision boundaries. So what we can do is instead of parameterize our decision boundary in terms of some hyperplane or some kind of function, what we could do is we could say, well, how about we classify, classify based on similarity? So nearest neighbor classification proceeds as follows. Let's say you're supposed to classify any point in this region over here. There are three training examples. This is a plus, this is a plus, and this is a circle or negative. Now, if you're asked to classify any point in this box, for example, this point over here, what nearest neighbor would do, it would say, well, let's check which one of the three training examples is the closest to my new point. In this case, it'd be this one over here. You check the label of that particular one, it's plus, and so you'd classify this new point as plus. You can do this for every point in that region if you want, and then that way visualize where you'd have a plus label, where a negative. The plus label is where everything's white, the negative label or circle label is where it's green. And so you see here that you have a decision boundary that's shaped quite differently from what you're used to because it's shaped based on the specific data points and wherever they happen to lie. You might say, well, it might be a little noisy to just go with the nearest neighbor because maybe the labels aren't always perfect. Um, if, that's the, if that's the case, um, you could use k nearest neighbors. What you do there is you look at the k nearest points and then you do a vote. You pick K to be odd for this to work out properly. So you pick some odd K, pick the K nearest points from your training set. And then based on those K points, you do a vote and you find out which label has the majority vote and that's what you go with. You can do this with multi-class uh, classification too. It doesn't have to be just two classes. Um, essentially, you just need to have a number of neighbors such that there is no tie in terms of which class you'd end up with. If you only pick one neighbor, there'll never be a tie. Pick more than one, be careful you don't end up with a tie. The key issue here then becomes how to define similarity. So in this drawing here, we define it just as Euclidean distance in this plane. Uh, but you can imagine when you think about, let's say, emails and you wanna see which is the closest email to another email you've seen, that 
maybe you need to do something a little more sophisticated, same for images and so forth. The trade-off here is that if you use a small k, um, you get the most relevant neighbors. So in some sense, it's best is the nearest points. But if the labels are noisy, then maybe you don't get enough information and might, might want to use a larger k to average out noise and have the signal prevail over noise. OK, so this is the first example of a totally different type of classification algorithm. What we've seen so far are called parametric algorithms. And what we're seeing today is a non-parametric approach. So this is today. This is last week. In parametric models, you assume some model. In naive Bayes, you assume a model of how the data gets generated. In Perceptron, you assume the model of what the decision boundary would look like. There are some free parameters in there. And based on the trained data, you find the best setting of those free parameters. The more data you have, the more accurately you can set those parameters. But at some point, as you, your amount of data gets larger and larger and larger, effectively what you get is convergence to some parameters. And those will be effectively the best parameters you can have. It won't go beyond that. In non-parametric models, what happens is as you get more data, you can increase the complexity of your classification boundary. All right? So let's look at an example here. We have two training examples. Decision, so there's one here and one here. That's what the decision boundary looks like. Actually, with two examples, it looks like a line still. Now we have 10 examples. It looks like this, much more complex. Um, 100 examples, make it even more complicated boundary. Now it turns out in this particular case, as you get even more examples, the boundary simplifies a bit again. You get this kind of crisp boundaries here that essentially have two regions one here and one here for positive, and then the other part is the negative region. What we see here happening is that the amount of training data affects the type of decision boundary you have. Initially, it was a line, then it got more complicated, even more complicated, and then it got simpler again in this case. Whereas for a perceptron or a naive base, the decision boundary will always be of the same type. It's just that the parameters will change with your data. All right. The ground truth in this case would look like this. So let's think about what we can do for a more realistic setting. Let's think about digit classification. So let's say you are given this digit over here, a scan of it. This is your training data. How do you proceed? You would compute which one is the closest match, or if you have a k nearest neighbor, you find the k closest matches, do a vote. So then the question is, what does it mean to be closest? Um, well. We encode these images by vector, a vector of intensities. This is 256 numbers, one number for each pixel, a number between 0 and 1. Okay. So what similarity function could we use? Well, when we have vectors, there's one natural option, which is the inner product. You just say, well, similarity between two vectors is the inner product. So x dotted with x prime, x and x prime, both in this case being 256 dimensional vectors. Um, and this is dot product is defined as the sum of the products of the corresponding entries. Um, okay. Often what's done for images is ahead of time normalizing the image, meaning that you make the norm of the vector representing the image equal to one. What does this do? It makes it more invariant to lighting, or in this case, the scan darkness or brightness. Um, of whatever you collected. Then often, then the result will be that the lowest you can go, assuming all numbers are positive, um, is zero. When you are, have completely zero similarity, which means two orthogonal vectors. And the maximum you can get is one. This is when the two vectors are completely identical. So by normalizing, everything gets put on a kind of common scale. It's easier to interpret what's happening. Okay. This might be a pretty naive similarity function, right? If a number is shifted over a little bit, um, the similarity between the vectors might be really, really low. So we'll have to start looking at better similarity functions to get this to work well in more complicated scenarios like this. Let's look into that. So actually, one thing I should highlight here is that when you run your nearest neighbor with similarity functions rather than distances, what you'll do is you'll look at which of your training examples has the highest similarity. 
rather than looking at which one has the smallest distance. Right? So what are some similarity functions we could look at? One we already saw is just the inner product. You could do the inner product of the raw pixels that you got or the raw input you got. You could also compute a feature vector first, like you've done already for Naive Bayes and for Ceptron, and then inner product the feature vectors. It's a very natural thing to do. Now you have flexibility in terms of choosing the features. You choose your features as the things that matter about these examples, and then this will be a meaningful measure. Simplified scenario is where the features are just the pixels and just f of x equals x. Um, doesn't have to be this particular form, but this is one form you could use. Now, if you want more invariance, you can start thinking about what you care about. Let's say you, in the case of digit classification, might care about invariance to rotation, scaling, translation, stroke thickness. So what you then want to do is you essentially you want to say, well, this one here and this one here are quite similar because they're only rotated versions of each other. They still have the same meaning. There might be limits to it. A six is a rotated nine, so a 180 degree flip might not be as much as you might want to allow here, but you want some invariance to rotation, some invariance to translation and stroke thickness. So the question becomes, how do you incorporate this kind of idea into your similarity measure? So one thing you can do is you can redefine your similarity measure as S prime here, which is the max over all similarities of, and you maximize here over all possible rotated versions that you could pick. Effectively, you have some example, another example, you see how far you, how much you allow for, let's say, maybe 15 degrees of rotation. Within 15 degrees of rotation in each direction, you see how close you can get them. Whatever is the most similar you can get these two inputs to be, that's going to be your similarity metric, and now you're invariant to rotations up to 15 degrees. Um, what this requires is this requires you to think about this all ahead of time. So ahead of time, you think about what are things I want to be invariant to, redefine your similarity metric to have an internal computation that computes all these variants as you compute a similarity and then pick the best one. There's something else you can do that effectively is the same thing that sometimes is more convenient to work with, sometimes not, it depends, but you can also do training data augmentation. The idea there is that rather than when you compute the similarity looking at the max, which we did on the previous slide, this is all ahead of time. As you get your training data, you say, I'm going to rotate my training data in all possible ways. I'm going to translate in all possible ways. I'm going to maybe skew it, maybe change the stroke thickness and so forth. And now one digit that was labeled becomes maybe a million digits with that label, which are the million variants you're able to come up with for that one training example. And so you're augmenting your train data, which can multiply by a factor of 1,000 or even a million in many cases. And now you have a lot more training examples. Now when you measure similarity, you can just go through your training data, find the closest match. You don't need to do that additional computation anymore at test time. So you're doing it all ahead of time. So that's training data augmentation. It'll effectively result in the same thing. Any questions about similarity metrics and how you might want to augment things based on invariances you're aware of. Yes. Okay, so what this notation means here, it's essentially saying if you have, if you have a vector that comes in, R is generating a curve in this 256 dimensional space, or it could be more than a curve if you allow for more than one variation to be induced, let's say translation and rotation, then you generate a two dimensional surface, and then you'd measure the distance between the two curves generated or the two two dimensional surfaces generated from those, from those two examples. That, that's one way to go about it. And you can also just do it for one of them, then measure the distance from the one you keep fixed to the curve or to the surface you, you generated. Either way will be the same thing. So you'd have this as your input image, 
This would result in, gen if you just rotate in this curve over here in a 256 dimensional space, which we didn't draw here, we just drew a three dimensional space on a two dimensional plane. Um, but it would generate a curve and that's, that's your R right there. That's your R. This here is your, don't stick. That curve there is R applied to that thing. All right, so what we've seen so far is a new way of doing classification. Nearest neighbor-like approaches, what do they do? They compute some similarity function between examples based on the closest matches, maybe the single closest match or multiple closest matches, do a vote based on that, decide on the label at test time. In contrast, what we've seen before when we looked at the perceptron, you explicitly at training time actually did something, right? With this nearest neighbor-like approach, you don't do anything at training time. You just store your data, you choose a similarity metric, and then when test data comes in, you use that similarity metric to help you decide what's, what's closest. Perceptron-like approaches at training time do more than that. They cycle through the training data and optimize the parameters of your decision boundary to do as well as possible on your training data while maybe tuning some hyperparameters on your holdout based on your holdout data to then hopefully do as well as possible on your test data. Right? So it's a very different kind of approach. Here you have a real kind of training phase and here, in the nearest neighbor-like approach, at best you'd have some kind of holdout phase, so to say, where you would say, well, I have maybe 10 different similarity metrics. Let's check on my holdout data, which of those 10 similarity metrics does best, and then go with that similarity metric for my test data, right? But you don't have the explicit training on the training data. So what we're gonna do in the, most of the remainder of this lecture is unify these two approaches into a single approach that does both. So the trick is called kernelization. So let's revisit the perceptron and then see how from there we can get to effectively a nearest neighbor-like approach. So if we learn a weight vector for the perceptron in multi-class, we'll learn multiple weight vectors, one weight vector wy for each class label y. Let's check what that vector could look like. So could it be any real vector? No, why not? The way training works is that when you get something right, it doesn't change. When you get something wrong, you add or subtract the current training example to the vector, right? So your wy will be of this format over here, some addition and subtraction of feature vectors from your training data. So generically, we can write it as follows. And what we have here is a weighted sum where alpha i, y are the weights of your training data vectors. What's the notation here? If, let's say, this stopped over here, we would have our, let's say, alpha be five-dimensional. So we have alpha 1 for class y, alpha 2 for class y, alpha 3 for class y, alpha 4 for class Y, alpha 5 for class Y. This one would be 1, this one is 0, this one is 0, this one is 0, this one is negative 1. And so if we know the alpha entries, we actually also know the weight factor. We can always go from the alpha entries using this equation over here to the weight factor and the other way around. Because as we learn the weight vector, we could just keep track of how often each training example contributed and with which sign, and that gives us the alpha vectors. And if we could just keep track of that instead of keeping track of the weight vector, we can choose. So these are dual representations. You can either keep track of wy or of the alpha vector, and they contain the same information. It will be one of those for each class label, so it'll be another one if you had a second class, another one if you had a third class, and so forth. Note that these entries don't have to be exactly one or negative one. If a training example gets encountered a second time, it results in an update again, 
it could become plus two or negative two or it could be set back to zero if you had a plus contribution first and then a negative contribution next. But they will be integers because you'll always be contributing either plus one or negative one in every step. Okay, so what if we now classify a new example x? We compute the feature vector, compute the inner product with the weight vector wy. We do that for all y and see which one scores the highest. So if we expand this using our alpha vector instead of w, we have this notation over here. We can now just do a little bit of basic math and rearrange this as follows, where we now have a summation which indexes over i. i is old training data, right? We're indexing from i equal one through some number of training data points. Each training data point will have a weight, alpha i, for class y. And then it'll get multiplied with the inner product of that specific training example, fxi, with the current feature vector, f of x, for the example you're trying to test. Okay, if we now rewrite this, it's just new notation for now, but it'll get important later that we have the ability to rewrite this. We write this as kxix. You can just think of k as a similarity measure. If you have two data points, you can compute kxix, which measures the similarity between them. We've already seen some similarity measures when we talked about nearest neighbors. In fact, the inner product was one choice of a similarity measure. That's the one that's happening over here. So what we see now is that we actually never need to build up the weight vectors w. We could, in principle, run the perceptron algorithm at all times, just keep track of the alpha entries. And then at test time, we actually never have to rebuild w. We can just use these alpha entries directly and the similarity measure, which in this case would be the inner product of the feature vectors, to compute the score for each label y. For now, this is just a rearrangement of, of computation. Nothing new has happened, right? It's just a different way of doing the same thing. So what does training of the dual perceptron look like? Dual referring to the fact that we're now keeping track of the alpha vectors rather than the w vectors. We still go through the training examples one by one, and we might have to cycle through the entire training data set multiple times till we're converged. When we try to classify example xn for each class, we compute this over here, which is the score. We, sh we see which class maximizes this score. If that corresponds to the label, nothing changes because our weight vectors, now our alpha vectors, are good enough to classify this example. If, on the other hand, it's wrong, the prediction based on this, we update. Originally, we'd update our weight vectors. In this case, we'll update our alpha vector. So the weight vector updates looked like this. Just as a reminder, wy is the weight vector corresponding to the label y that you predict. y star is the label that was provided in the training data set. y star is the correct label. You want a higher score for y star, so you augment the weight vector wy star with f of xn, which will make the inner product between wy star and f of xn higher. And you decrease the inner product between wy and f of xn because you didn't want y to win, so you want to lower its score when it, the score is computed for y for the input xn. In terms of alpha updates, actually looks a lot simpler. You just keep track, you say, well, the alpha vector is really a set of vectors, one for each class label. Um, the entry n, which is the entry corresponding to the nth training example for the alpha y vector, gets decreased by one, and the nth entry for the alpha y star vector gets increased by one. Any questions about the algorithm? Yes? Okay, so the meaning of alpha, let's say we have a three class classification problem, right? So let's say we have three classes, A, B, and C. Let's say we have a five dimensional feature vector. So F of X lives in R5. Then what alpha explicitly would look like 
alpha would be, you'd have a alpha A, which is a vector, which would consist of five entries, alpha A1, alpha A2, alpha A3, alpha A4, alpha A5, where this five corresponds to, sorry, this, isn't, this was wrong here. Let's, we have five, um, find some space, five training examples. And so this will correspond to tracking how much the first training example contributes. This is the second training example, third, fourth, and fifth training example. Then there'll be alpha B, which is set up the same way. There'll be alpha B1, alpha B2, alpha B3, alpha B4, alpha B5, and it will be alpha C, which is set up the same way. What's well, important to keep in mind that one through five corresponds to training examples one through five. Your feature vector dimensionality doesn't show up here. So you can already start kind of reasoning about, well, when there is a very high dimensional feature vector, this might be nice because you're not explicitly working with the high dimensional feature vector. You are working with a feature, with an alpha vector the size of number of training examples. So if you have a lot of training examples, it might become a little expensive doing it this way. Um, but that's, that's a trade-off here that your alpha vectors have dimensionality of number of training examples, whereas your original weight vectors have dimensionality of the feature space. Any other questions about the algorithm? So as you start the algorithm, each one of those alpha vectors would be initialized all zeros. Then as your first training example comes in, training example one, you check what the scores that you get out, you'd have a tie because it's all zeros, but let's assume, let's assume you classify wrong. You break ties the wrong way, then, and your first training example is of class A, and you classified it as B, then alpha A1 would become plus one to increase the score on that first training example, and then alpha B1 would become negative one to decrease the score on that first training example for class B. And then when the next example comes in, same thing would happen. You check, am I getting the right class label out as a prediction? If so, nothing happens. If not, then these entries get updated by a plus one or a negative one update depending on, well, whether you were the right class label or the wrong class label. So, so far this is just mechanics, right? So we got the mechanics in place, now we're gonna look at why we might care about this. Okay, so what's interesting here is that what we found is that you can compute the score for a label Y and input X originally in the original perceptron as a weight vector wy times f of x, but now as a weighted sum of similarity computations. So what we have now, we have something like nearest neighbor computations, right? If you get a new example in, what are you doing? You're computing similarity with training examples, and then you're taking a weighted sum of those similarity scores, right? This is weighting those similarity scores. What would happen if we, Let's say degraded this to nearest neighbor. What would nearest neighbor do? Nearest neighbor would say the kernel score is always zero, except for the one closest example. And for the one closest example, the score is one. And the alpha entry would essentially be always be a, a plus for the correct label, a plus one, and a negative one for the incorrect label. And so it would say, well, the correct label, which is the one that's closest, has a plus one score, everything else is a negative one score. And so now you have, out of this representation, your one nearest neighbor again. If you had k nearest neighbor, 
Same thing would happen. You'd say all the you'd find the k nearest points. Among those k nearest points, you'd then give all of those a similarity measure of one. All the others would have a similarity measure of zero. Again, these entries, the alpha entries would be plus one for the correct class label, negative one for the incorrect class label, and you'd get out essentially majority vote out of this representation. What we have here is something that goes beyond that. Here we don't just look at the one closest or k closest and give those a one and everything else a zero. This similarity measure can be more smooth. It can say, well, I measure similarity and it's somewhat close, less close, and so forth. And all of these examples can contribute in a soft way, contribute more or less depending on how similar they are. And then what's also different is that these alpha entries, rather than being fixed to plus one or negative one, as what would happen in nearest neighbors, they are learned. You are cycling through your training data, and based on your training data, you are deciding what the right weights are to make this work out. So effectively what you're doing here, you're doing something like a nearest neighbors, but with a soft way of measuring distance rather than a cutoff at the k nearest neighbors, and with an intelligent way of setting these weights based on your training data. For example, if you had a noisy example, if you train the dual perceptron, it would learn to effectively ignore that noisy example because it would learn weights for the other ones to overrule that, and you'd still get a good label in that region. So, special case of nearest neighbor where you actually can train on your training data and you can have a more sophisticated way of measuring similarity as you compute your score. I still ask the question, well, why do we care? Why do we need to do this? Now we know that we can effectively have a perceptron act like a nearest neighbor. Why not just work with the original perceptron? Why work with this dual perceptron, right? So the kernel trick, something that says that you can substitute in pretty much any similarity function in place of the dot product. So rather than thinking about feature vectors, and when you're asked to compute kxix, compute your feature vectors and dot product them, you write a piece of code that is just your similarity function, your kernel function. You pass in two examples, and it spits out a number. That's higher when they're more similar, lower when they're less similar. Do some fine print here. Um, don't worry about the fine print too much. If you ever start running into trouble, do start worrying about it, but um, don't worry about it for 188. Essentially, there are some things that have to be true about your similarity measure for these calculations to all work out. In practice, pretty much any reasonable similarity function you pick will satisfy those properties. Okay, so now we can learn new kinds of hypotheses because we're not restricted to first choose a feature vector and then in a product is, on the inner product, then we can just use a kernel function straight up, run the dual perceptron, never worrying about feature vectors and effectively get much richer decision boundaries. Instead of having a linear decision boundary in the original space, so let me just clarify the drawing here. Once you use a kernel function, what you could do is after the fact, you could look at your two-dimensional plane if it's, a, if it's a 2D problem. For every point in that plane at some discretization level, compute the label, visualize the decision boundary, and what you'll see is that it won't be a line anymore if you pick a kernel that's not just a trivial kernel. So, why is this useful? Often your data is not linearly separable, like this, okay, this is all good, very simple data set, you just need a threshold, but often that's not the case in practice. Maybe your data looks like this. And usually it'll be high dimensional, but this is just a low dimensional example where a linear separator is not gonna get the job done. What might you wanna do? You could introduce extra features. You could say, well, what if I introduce instead of x, also x squared, now I'm embedding my data in a two-dimensional space, even though it came in one-dimensional, it's like computing two features from your single incoming feature. The original feature is retained x, and you add x squared. Now you can actually find a linear decision boundary. So what just happened here? We went from an input that was lower dimensional to a higher dimensional input, and all of a sudden, these linear decision boundaries are not nearly as restrictive anymore because in high dimensions, it turns out if you have enough dimensions, you can separate pretty much anything with a linear decision boundary. But if you project this back into the original space, 
then the decision boundary will look like this, where you carve out this middle part. So in high dimensional space, it's linear. In the low dimensional space, you end up with a nonlinear decision boundary. Often you, you can do this. I mean, we will even like to ask you this. Things like, you know, here is a two dimensional data set. Um, it's not linearly separable in its original format, but if we compute a new feature, which is distance to the origin, then now all of a sudden, the points far away from the origin are in that third dimension, very high up, so to say, and the ones close are lower, and you can just slice a plane between the two, the red and the blue dots, and have your linear separation between the two classes in the three-dimensional space, even though there was no linear separation between the two classes in the two-dimensional space. So this is interesting. This is essentially augmenting our feature space to still find linear decision boundaries. Now, there's a close relationship with kernels. So if you use the linear kernel, you're effectively continuing to live in your original feature space. But if you use nonlinear kernels, anything else, you're effectively augmenting your feature space by computing a new feature vector that typically will be much higher dimensional than your original feature vector. And effectively what that kernel is doing, it's interproducting those high dimensional feature vectors with each other without you ever needing to compute those high dimensional feature vectors. So here's an example. If as a kernel, you pick this quantity over here, inner product between x and x prime plus one and then square that quantity. That's a kernel. If you want to think about what does that mean in terms of features, well, we can expand this. We get this expression over here. What does this tell us? It tells us that this thing over here is the inner product between two feature vectors. What are the entries? The first entry is something like, um, we have indexing over all i and j, so it would be something like, x1, x1, corresponding to this. And x1, x1 prime, x1 prime, corresponding to this. If i and j change, you'd get something like x1, x2, and you get x1, x2, both primed. Then you might get x1, x3, x1 prime, x3 prime. Then this will maybe be, if its original space is three-dimensional, it will be x2. Um, depending on how this indexes, whether it has all combinations once or twice, it would be an x2, x1, and an x2 prime, x1 prime, x2, x2, x2 prime, x2 prime, and so forth. To get this part, then to get this part, you'd have square root of 2, x1, square root of 2, x1 prime, square root of 2, x2, square root of 2, x2 prime, square root of 2, x3, square root of 2, x3 prime. And then to get this last one, you have the bias feature. That's just one. So what we see here is that these new feature vectors, which you can compute from your original feature vector, the original feature vector is just x1, x2, x3, maybe with a 1 at the end. So from the original feature vector, you can go to a new feature vector, which is higher dimensional quite a bit higher dimensional. If this is just three, but for some, if this goes up to some k in general rather than three, this one will be of dimension k squared roughly, whereas the original one of dimension k, so this can grow very quickly. So you'd have something that's order k squared sitting over here as your new feature vector, much higher dimensional space. You might hope that you can get a linear separation in that higher dimensional space, and so you could run your primary perceptron algorithm from last week with these feature vectors shown here, or you could never bother computing the feature vectors and run the dual perceptron algorithm directly with this kernel function over here. Those will be equivalent. We'll give you the same answer. The advantage of running the dual perceptron is that you never have to compute these roughly k squared dimensional feature vectors. You can just use your original feature vectors, compute similarities there. Right, the amount of computation that happens here is order k squared, whereas here it's order k. 
This is for a quadratic kernel. You can imagine doing the same thing for a cubic kernel, a, a, a quartic kernel, and so forth, where you essentially start building up bigger and bigger feature vectors, introducing higher and higher order monomials based on the original features, build this huge feature vector, but by using the dual perceptron, you never have to actually build it up. You can directly work in the original space and be more efficient. So this is a clear advantage of using the dual perceptron. You don't have to go through this high dimensional feature space, but you still get the benefit because implicitly, everything that's happening underneath, you can still think of as happening in that high dimensional space. And in that high dimensional space, you are finding some decision boundary. You can still think of error bounds like we had for the perceptron. We said something like error bound is related to the margin and the dimensionality of the feature space, right? So here you know you're now working in a k-squared dimensional feature space, so you still have an error bound. It's now will involve k-squared rather than k, some more complex feature space, but the same things still hold true, even though you're working in this kernel space. Gets even more interesting if you look at kernels where the corresponding feature vector is infinite dimensional. So this is a reasonable kernel, right? X minus x minus x prime norm squared. So what is this doing? It's saying that if you have two points, you compute the Euclidean distance in the original space, you square that Euclidean distance, and then do e to the minus that distance. So if the distance is very large, e to the minus something very large will be close to zero, so the similarity will be about zero. If the distance is very small, and the limit of the distance is zero, then this will be e to the minus zero, which is one. So this thing lands between zero and one, super close, it's close to one, far away, it's close to zero. You can find a feature vector, much like the one over here, it just turns out that that feature vector will be infinitely long, but it exists. And so now it's completely impractical to run the original perceptron algorithm, because if you wanted to run that, you'd have to do infinite amount of computation, whereas using the dual perceptron, you can compute directly these alpha entries, never go to the primal space, and work with this kernel over here. This is an interesting kernel here, right? This exponential kernel, it will act a lot like nearest neighbors, right? Because it's essentially looking at most of the distance between points. You're very similar if you're close. You're not similar if you're far apart. And so if you want to get something as close as possible to what you think of as nearest neighbors, but you want to tune the alpha entries to tune the voting in the nearest neighbors, you would run dual perceptron with this kernel over here. Um, one thing you might want to play with, by the way, then, is that you can have a parameter here, which you might call sigma squared, for example, and you could then tune how far out you want to look from any given point, how quickly that kernel drops to zero, and you would use your holdout data to decide which sigma squared is the best choice. Yes? Um, it's a good question. So this corresponds to, it's called a Gaussian kernel often, or a radial basis function kernel. Um, the Gaussian is a well-known distribution. It's usually not the distribution aspect that matters here. It's the fact that it's a radial basis function, so that the more typical variants of this would not be, let's say, all of a sudden a Poisson distribution or something like that, but the more typical variance would be something like, oh, maybe let's use e to the minus norm x minus x prime without the square, or maybe a higher order power, or maybe you use something yet a little different. So this is a Gaussian kernel, which looks like this, right? You might say, well, maybe I want something that looks more like this, where the similarity is zero from a certain point onwards, because I don't want to, in practice, it can be more convenient, because with a Gaussian kernel, you actually have to look at all training examples, because all will have a non-zero contribution. You might say I'm approximating it, and I'm maybe cutting it off and making it zero at some point, so I don't have to look at all for their non-zero contributions. So a lot of the variants relate to cutting things off and how steeply this falls off. There are other types of kernels out there. String kernels. What's a string kernel? Um, in some algorithms class, you might have seen something uh, It's a string matching algorithm where you get two strings and you see, well, what's the edit distance between two strings? Like how many shifts do I have to do? How many swaps do I have to do to go from one string to another string? That distance, 
you can effectively put, take the negative that, put it in the exponent, and you'd have something like a kernel. I mean, you have to be a little careful to get the right properties, but effectively, any way you have to measure similarity, whether it's between Euclidean, well, real vectors or strings or yet some other input that you get, um, often it's easier to come up with a similarity measure than it is to come up with a new feature space, especially if that feature space would have to be very high dimensional. All right, so we went through a lot of the justification for why we want to use kernels, right? The question is, can't you just add these features on your own, like all pairs of features instead of using the quadratic kernel? The answer is yes, in principle you could. You could just compute them. There's no need to modify any algorithms, but the number of features can get very large and the algorithm can become very slow because you have such a high dimensional feature space. And then some of these kernels are much more easily thought of in terms of their actual kernel function than in terms of their feature vector expansion. The Gaussian kernel feature vector expansion has some Fourier basis stuff in there, which is not all that intuitive in terms of what you're thinking about here. It's much more intuitive to think of it as an approximation of what happens in nearest neighbors and we have some kind of fall off rather than a rigid only the k nearest ones get to contribute. So the nice thing about using the kernel-based representation is you can work with these features implicitly. So infinite dimensional feature vectors become fine. Um, there is a cost though. You need to compute the similarity to every training datum. Well, maybe not every one of them after you're done training. If one of them has all the alpha entries equal to zero, you never have to look at them again. But usually many of, the, many of them, if not all of them, will have some alpha entry that's non-zero corresponding to that example, and now you have to compute similarity with it any time you test something. So test time, things might be a little more expensive. So, classification is the first thing we've looked at in machine learning. It's an example of a supervised learning problem. What does that mean? It means that we get data, and the data consists of two parts. There's the input x, and then the label Y that in the future we'd like to predict. It's supervised in that for your training data, you are told for every input example where you have an X, what the label Y is. That's the supervision. You're supposed to then make predictions later when you just get X. We've seen a few methods for this. Naive Bayes, Perceptron, nearest neighbors, and now dual Perceptron. It's useful when you have labeled data. So let's take a break here. And after the break, let's start looking at a, at a different type of machine learning that's not supervised learning anymore. Right, let's restart. Any questions about classification, supervised learning, kernels, nearest neighbors? Yes. So is nearest neighbors thing also considered supervised learning? So is nearest neighbors also considered supervised learning? Um, the answer is yes. So nearest neighbors, you are faced with a problem where you get training examples that have corresponding labels and you're asked to make predictions about new instances, what their labels are based on what you've seen in the training data. So that's essentially what defines supervised learning. Now it's true that not a lot of learning is happening in nearest neighbors because you are just looking things up at test time rather than having learned some new representation, um, but it would still fall into the category of supervised learning approaches to classification. Okay, so classification, um, nice analogy. It's a lot like test taking. There is something that you're supposed to learn, and then there is test data at the end, which could be an exam or it could be new data. And you haven't seen the answer to that. You try to produce the answer, and you hope that it's indeed the right answer based on what you've learned so far. Clustering is a little different. It's a lot more like, say, baby listening to things. Baby has no clue just hearing all kinds of sounds, 
and who knows what they make of it. Um, so what's happening in clustering? It's unsupervised learning, meaning that there is no right answer. You just get data. There is no such thing like a Y, so to say a class label that you're supposed to predict or that you're being told is the right label. You're just getting, let's say, a bunch of email, but nobody tells you what's spam or ham. You get a bunch of digits, scans of digits, but nobody tells you which one is a zero, one, and so forth. The goal in clustering is to detect patterns in unlabeled data. So, for example, you could get a bunch of emails and you want to group them. You don't have labels yet, but maybe you just got a thousand new emails and to process them more effectively, you want them clustered. And you hope maybe that some cluster will emerge that's all related to one topic and you can process them all in one go. Another topic will emerge in another cluster. You can process those in one go and that could be a use case of clustering, right? Could be for search results. Let's say you are searching for something and maybe you're searching for something, you have a sentence and there might be multiple interpretations of that sentence, right? And now there are different types of pages that could come back. Rather than just giving you back the top 10 ranked pages, you might hope that it says, oh, well, there are five interpretations. The first cluster is all the pages in the first interpretation. The second cluster, all the pages in the second interpretation and so forth. Now, we haven't defined those interpretations, so clustering would just do something. It might be the clustering you like or the one you don't like, um, but that's the idea. If you have a lot of customer data, maybe you are some kind of store and you want to cluster your customers. You want to get some idea of what types of customers do you have. You might look at their purchasing data. If it's an online store, maybe their, maybe their browsing behavior with products they have looked at but not bought ultimately and so forth. And based on that, group your customers and then maybe you can start analyzing more easily what the patterns are that you see among your visitors. Another thing that you could do is you could look at program executions. You could look at execution traces, vectorize those in some way, then cluster them, and hopefully you'd see clusters emerge com related to normal be behavior, and then maybe some other ones that don't fall in any of the clusters where something weird is happening. You want to go, want to go check what's going on. So this is useful when you don't know exactly what you're looking for. You just have some data. You hope there are some patterns to your data, but your data is high dimensional. Well, let's be clear. If you had two dimensional data, you would just plot it. You would look at it and that would be it. But imagine your data is a thousand dimensional, a million dimensional. Just plotting it is not really an option. And so now you want some other tool to figure out what patterns, what cluster there might be in your data. Often you get out gibberish. It's part of the deal here because you're not supervising it. You're not telling it what you're looking for. You're just saying, cluster my data into groups, right? All right, so simple thing, of course, would be something where you just cluster by color, um, and we'll use that as an illustration as we go along, but um, really, you don't know what you're looking for. So let's say these are a bunch of points, and we're visualizing these in 2D because that's the way we can build intuition, but keep in mind, if your data is really 2D, probably don't have to worry about clustering. Just plot your data and do your analysis. Let's say your data were to look like this, but in some high dimensional space, let's say. Um, maybe you'd hope that there would be two clusters coming out of your algorithm, these two clusters. Now, here is a very different kind of data, right? And you might want to get out these two clusters. This is very different, right? So you look at this, this point, and this point are quite far apart, actually, but they fall in the same cluster, right? In fact, these two points are closer together than these two points. Nevertheless, these two are in a separate cluster and these two are in the same cluster. What's happening here is something where it's looking at closest neighboring points. If you have a neighbor share with another point, then you're also in the same cluster. So this is something we'll see at the end of lecture called agglomerative clustering. And then this here is what we'll see, we'll call k-means will give us this result, which is where you look at localized blobs of data. So one way to measure similarity is look at the distance between two points, right? Say, find a group of points that are all close together. So k-means gives you one way of doing that. What's happening in k-means? You pick, so this is the algorithm, you pick k 
random points as your cluster senders. Okay, so we just did that here. We picked one, two, three, four, five random points. When I say random points, the simplest thing is to pick actually, in this case, five of your data points. Don't just randomly generate a point that might be anywhere in space. Just pick randomly five points from your data set in this case. And then you alternate. You alternate between assigning data instances to the closest mean. So what does that mean? You'd look at, well, for each one of those points, there are points that are closest to that point and then the other points. And this actually gives a decision boundary pattern like this here. Everything that's over here, their closest point is that one over there among our five centers. And you would assign all of those points to that center. Do the same thing, all points over here go to this point, this center, and all points here go to this center. And we do that for all five regions, right? You don't have to actually compute those regions. You would actually cycle through your data for each data point, you check which one of those five is the closest and you assign it to the closest one. Once you've done that, you compute the mean of, for each cluster, you compute, or for each center, you look at all the points assigned to that center, you compute the mean of those points, and that becomes your new cluster center. So if I go, compute the mean of all the points that lie in this area, be some kind of mean, maybe it'd be over here, and that would be your new cluster sender for the first cluster. If you do that for all five of them, you now have five new cluster senders, and you repeat. You now cycle through your training data again, find for each training data point the closest current cluster sender. Once you've done that, for each cluster sender, you average all the ones assigned to it, that generates the new cluster sender, you keep repeating until no points change their assignment anymore. You reach a fixed point, nothing changes anymore. Okay, so cluster centers would move here, and this would then repeat. So here's an example of this in action. <clears throat> we started with five center points, randomly chosen from the data. To visualize each of the current clusters, we choose colors, so there's a blue cluster, green, purple, red, black. We've colored everything according to the closest point among our centers. Then we take the average of all blue points, which will give our new cluster center for blue. Same for green, red, purple, black. We get this over here. Then we reassign, recompute the means for each cluster. That will be a new center. And we repeat this until this doesn't change anymore. Okay, so let's look at this again. This is how k-means tends to play out. So we start with just some arbitrary set of points that are our cluster centers. We split the data according to where, whatever they're closest to, take the mean, new cluster center. We see here that we have the green covering both of those. That's, for, that's the case for now, but we'll see that at some point that will get pushed out. Same thing here, we'll have this cluster, which we really would think of as one cluster, split by two centers. But we'll see that actually over time, things will shift around and we'll get a pretty clean split of our data into the clusters that we might hope for. Is this guaranteed to happen? No, this happens to happen here. Um, if we had picked three clusters instead of five, we'd end up with something quite different. We picked 10 instead of five, we'd end up with something quite different. So there's a lot of choices to be made here um, that you don't know ahead of time what the right choice is. So you'll have to try many things. So here's a general trick that comes back a lot in machine learning. We're seeing it in the context of k-means, but it's actually a pretty important idea. So that often you have an intuitive notion of what an algorithm could look like, like this k-means algorithm. It makes sense, right? You assign things to the closest current cluster, you re-average and keep doing this. But are you guaranteed that this will converge, that it will reach a fixed point or not? One way to analyze this is to see if there is a optimization problem that you can associate with what you are doing. Because if there's an optimization problem associated with it, and what you are doing is optimizing an objective, and in every step you're making that score better, then you know that at some point if that score cannot be infinitely good, you need to reach some kind of limit, and that's your current local maximum or maybe global maximum that you're achieving 
In this case, you're minimizing your global minimum, hopefully, but maybe a local minimum, and then you can give convergence guarantees that way. Okay? So you can avoid the concept of cycling, right? Because you can imagine, well, what happens if we reassign and so forth? Can we get in a cyclic pattern? Well, if you can show you're optimizing an objective function, that objective function is always getting better. That means you can never land in a cyclic pattern because a cyclic pattern would mean that your objective function goes back up, comes back down, and so forth. So the objective function for k-means that you can back out, if you think about it carefully, is that we're looking at the sum of the distances for each data point xi to its cluster sender CAI, where AI is the assignment that we have for data point I. So AI is an index into one of our K cluster centers. Okay. So what are we looking at here? We have points XI, which we can't change. We have assignments AI, which are variables. We can choose any assignment for each data point, and assign it to cluster one, two, three, up to K. We have a choice. And then there are the means that we're keeping track of. And we're defining this objective here as a function of all of those. And the claim is that each iteration in k-means will make this objective function go down, meaning that you cannot get into a cyclic pattern that you keep oscillating. There are two stages in each iteration. There is an update of the assignments, which keeps the means fixed, but changes what you're assigned to for each data point. And there's an update of the means, which fixes the assignments for each data point, but changes the means. So to show that we're reducing this objective in each iteration, what we can do is if we can show that we reduce the objective in the first step and in the second step, then together they definitely reduce the objective and we know we're in every step reducing this objective function. Okay, so the first one is updating assignments. What's happening there? The assignment we pick is the minimum over all possible choices of clusters, current cluster senders of the distance between xi and each of the cluster senders, right? Okay, well, so what that does is for an example like this, you have some cluster centers, you'd go to um, the, you have a current assignment that computed the means, and then your new assignment will be something like this, where you have the points associated with whatever is closest right now. This is old, this is new. Okay. What's our objective function? Our objective function is the sums of the distances of each data point to its assigned cluster center. If initially it was assigned to some cluster center and we now assign it to the closest one, that distance can only go down. So very easy to show that distance will always go down in this step of the algorithm because you pick the closest one. It can never get worse. Second update is updating the means. So what we do there is we say these cluster centers are going to be relocated at the average of all the data points assigned to that cluster center, all right? So we have our assignment. This is old. We have our old cluster centers. We do this update, what happens is the centers will shift to the means of the corresponding data points. Intuitively, we see that these centers are shifting closer to all of the points here. As a consequence, the score that we're looking at, remember, the sum of the distances should only decrease. It can never go up because we're bringing it closer. Now, I should do, need to do a little bit of math to show this. We're not doing the math on this slide, but effectively, you can show that if you assign your center to be the average of all of the points, that'll be a closer sum of distances than any other location you could put your center at. It's the optimal location to put it at given that fixed set of points. That's a small optimization problem to solve. Essentially, solve an optimization problem, find the coordinates that minimize the sum of distances, and you'll find that it is the average. Okay, so that's what we're using here. We're not proving this, but this can be proved. One thing left now, we, we know the algorithm. We know it's guaranteed to not get into cycles, but rather keep decreasing an objective criterion, which is a good thing. We still need to initialize, right? We need some initial means to kick this off. It's actually a non-deterministic algorithm because we do this randomly, right? Here is one initialization, which would lead to good results. Um, but things can go wrong if you have a bad initialization. Think about this here. Can you think of a bad initialization? The black ones are the data points. Can you think of a bad set of 
centeredness that would lead to a different result that you probably don't want. Well, here's an example. What if you place center here, here, and then the red one over here? That's the grouping you'll get. You'll end up with the clustering that I've drawn there, which is probably not the one you'd hope to end up with, right? Now, if you did this, you would actually, and if you compared what you get from these two initializations, you can actually look at your objective criterion, the sum of the squared distances, right? That's what we're optimizing. And you'd realize that this one, after iterating, will land in a better score than the one on the right. And so you'd run this multiple times, multiple initializations, see which one has the best score, retain that one, right? So a couple of things you can do, we're not gonna get into a lot of details about it, but you can essentially look at your clusters. For example, this cluster over here, you can say, well, this cluster has very high variance compared to all other clusters. So maybe I should introduce two centers there instead of the one center. And now you have end up four centers total and work with that. And you can do something similar here. You'd say, well, these two centers are very close. If I were to merge those two, it wouldn't change my objective function all that much, only a little bit worse, so let's merge those two. So there's all kind of tricks you can play there to get this to work better. Um, either way, you can always end up stuck in the local minimum. You have to be careful about that and use many, many initializations till you have done enough runs to find a good answer, so to say, right? For example, this here is not exactly what you'd want. Again, maybe if you looked at the variance in that cluster, you decide that you want two points and it split up. Same thing here, not exactly what you want. Maybe you'd realize that you can merge them. These are kind of little hacks you have to do to get this to work sometimes. Okay, so will it converge? The answer is yes. Uh, to a global optimum, no. We've seen many cases where it would get stuck in something that's not the best scoring clustering. So, We'll always find the true patterns in the data. Well, not clear. It's not even clear what the true patterns are. You haven't defined that, right? There are var variants of clustering where you might define what is the right clustering and then might try to learn the cluster. But as defined here, there's no right clustering. So there's no way for it to be guaranteed to find the right clustering, right? The patterns are very, very clear. The data is nicely segregated with enough initializations. Probably you'll find what you're looking for. Um, We'll find something interesting. Again, it depends. It also depends a lot on your feature space, right? Because measuring these Euclidean distances, if those are not meaningful, you're gonna find non-meaningful clusters, okay? So something to think about there, I'm sure it's a past exam question at some point, you can find in one of the old exams is, well, can you run something like k-means where you use a similarity measure, essentially a kernelized version of k-means where you use any kind of similarity measure rather than just distance-based clustering, right? People use it, yeah, people definitely use it. I mean, it's one of the standard ways to analyze your data and try to discover patterns. Um, how many clusters to pick? You try many things and you see what seems to work out best. The natural thing to do is something like what you do in supervised training. Let's say you had some on the horizontal axis, number of clusters. And then you'd have one cluster, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. You then, one is maybe not that meaningful, so let's start at two. You run your k-means from some initialization, maybe you have a score, this is the score. That's over here. Another initialization, maybe you land here, another one here. You run a bunch of initializations, this is your best one. And with three, let's assume your best score is here. With four, maybe it's here. Then maybe with five, it's here. With six, it's here. What you see is some kind of pattern where there's a knee in the curve here. And typically, you pick your number of clusters corresponding to that knee point. You say, well, I know that more clusters will always allow me to get a better score because I'm minimizing some of distances. And the more centers I have, the more flexibility, so the better I can do. But at some point, it starts not helping much to have more clusters. And so it might not be meaningful to keep adding those clusters and you wanna be right here, right before you kind of get this diminishing return. Or maybe you try a few numbers for K right here in that area. Look at your data that way, see what you can find. 
So this is one way to cluster. That's k means. It's a very global way of measuring distances. You're always looking at a cluster in its entirety and looking at the mean for that entire cluster and everything needs to be close to the mean. Okay. Now, agglomerative clustering works very differently. It starts bottom up. It merges very similar instances and it incrementally builds larger and larger clusters out of the small cluster. So you could start with every data point being its own cluster. And if you have a close neighbor, merge them together in a slightly bigger cluster and keep going. Right? So at all times, you have a set of clusters. Initially, each one, each data point is its own cluster. Repeat, pick the two closest clusters. Haven't defined close, but let's assume we have a measure of close. Pick the two that are closest together, merge them into a new cluster, and keep going until only one cluster is left. You might say, well, only one cluster left. We already know everything's going to be in that cluster. But the idea here is that you have different resolutions of clustering that come out. You can browse your data at different levels of resolution this way. Whereas when you have only one cluster left, of course, there's not much you can do, but you can see when there's two clusters left, three and so forth, it will be some kind of tree structure in which way you can browse your data. Okay? So you'll merge two points, another two points, and you'll get this kind of tree structure being built up that at the top of the, the tree structure, you'll have all your data clustered together, but then you can go down and see at different granularities where things are. You need to measure distance. You can measure distance in many ways. Um, measure distance between clusters. One way to measure distance between clusters is the closest pair. What that means is for two clusters, you look at all their points and you see which two points, one from each, where you have to take one from each cluster, is, gives you the smallest distance and that's the distance between the two clusters. You can look at the furthest pair, that's complete link clustering. There you want all points in your cluster to be very similar rather than just having some kind of connection between points. You can look at the average, which is something in between. Um, you can look at something that relates to variance, which is a lot like k-means. Depending on what you use, you'll get a different hierarchical clustering out here. Here's an example of clustering in action. So a lot of you might have used this, Google News. What's happening? A lot of news articles come out. They're not labeled, nobody's telling Google this is label one, it's label two, and so forth. Um, what's happening is that all these different outlets have articles, and it turns out that there's a lot of articles in this snapshot about heavy fighting continues as Pakistan army battles Taliban. It's from a few years ago. See that there's, in this case, 3,824 news articles that ended up in this one cluster. Now, this is text. So the way this cluster is represented here is that there's some kind of scoring metric in terms of which of the actual articles is the most representative. That's shown. If you had something more numeric, you could actually show the mean that represents that cluster, but for text, it's not that clear what that would be if you did that. And so articles are clustered. Here is another cluster. This one has 2,492 articles. Here is yet another cluster. You can see that there's a little bit of supervision they did here. So the cluster, news articles, but they also had some supervised data somehow to decide that these, these first two clusters fall under world, the next two clusters fall under business, these two fall under US, and so forth. So it's a combination of some supervised learning and clustering to give you the results here. All right, any questions about clustering? Okay, let's stop here for today. And next time we will look at some decision trees and neural nets.